Hello everyone, I'm Afaf Kanja and welcome to South South News. We're very happy to have joining us today the permanent representative of Fiji to the United Nations, Ambassador Peter Thompson. Ambassador Thompson, well, thank you for joining us here on South South News. Nice to be it's a here. pleasure to meet you. Thank you. From the top, really, I, it's so imperative to talk about security and climate change. As typhoons are increasing, as hurricanes are, of course, been hitting Fiji, and reportedly sea levels are rising on a very visual sense to, to Fijians. So climate change isn't a thematic debate, if you will. It's a real issue that's imposing, uh, you know, uh, Fijians today. Tell us what the government of Fiji has been doing, is doing in terms, in terms of short-term and long-term strategies for its security. Hmm. Look, uh, security and climate change, uh, you may know, is uh, coming before the Security Council in um, July during Germany's presidency. Uh, to a large extent, this is because of the German government having listened to uh, IOSIS, of which Fiji is a member, and to the Pacific Small Island Developing States, of which obviously Fiji is a member as well. Uh, we, this has been central to the work of the small island states at the United Nations uh, to bring the world's attention to exactly what you describe, rising sea levels in particular, which are a major threat. Uh, in Fiji's case, we have uh, over 360 islands, uh, many of which are high volcanic islands. So our existence is not threatened, but many of our neighbors, uh, Marshall Islands, Tuvalu, Kiribati, which are atoll republics, uh, their very existence is threatened uh, because r sea levels are predicted to rise over the 90, next 90 years by somewhere between 1.5 meters, if you want to be hopeful, and two meters if you want to be careful. So a two meter rise uh, really does extinguish the, the available land of these atoll republics. So it is a, it's a huge security issue. To answer your question of what uh, we're doing to address that, well, we've brought it before the um, uh, United Nations at all levels, including, as I say, the Security Council level. Um, and uh, obviously our attention is mainly focused on the UNFCCC process, which uh, all the Pacific Islands, including Fiji, play a very active role in. Um, a meeting in Bangkok has just finished. So at the international level, this is what we're doing, and it's, as I say, central to our work. Uh, at, uh, as far as what we're doing back home, uh, it's both adaption and mitigation. Uh, we have, um, in our Ministry of Defense, uh, we have uh, set up um, a um, organization called DISMAC, which looks at everything from uh, better forecasting systems, uh, you know, better warnings and so on, uh, to um, better measures to take during cyclones, um, which, as you say, hit us regularly now, um, and also to address uh, the more long-term issues of infrastructure development, where that should go to cope with all this. Ambassador Thompson, let's cross over to the Millennium Development Goals. Where is Fiji on target and where does Fiji possibly need help in attaining these goals by and of course ongoingly after 2015? Um, look, on the NDGs, we've, uh, we've done reasonably well. Um, uh, there, there are some areas where um, our report card uh, needs uh, improvement. Uh, but for example, in the um, MDG 1, uh, we have not done particularly well. And uh, I put that down to the effects of urbanization. Um, we've got a very rapidly urbanizing population. And uh, so that is one big effect. Then there's also the global uh, economic effects of you know, the economic downturn around the world. And uh, th that inevitably, with rising food prices and with slower levels of investment, uh, foreign investment, uh, is going to have an effect on the economic activity in the country, thereby the income and thereby the poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, we, so MDG 1, the eradication of extreme poverty and hunger, uh, we, are, we will probably not meet our goal by that time. Um, on, the, on, on 2, we've uh, done very well indeed. Uh, we will meet that goal. That's a, we have a 99% uh, school enrollment at primary school level, so uh, that one um, is is, Congratulations. is in key. good shape. Yeah, on MDG three, uh, a mixed result. This is on promotion of gender equality and empowerment of women. 
there, there has been, under the Fiji government's current reform program, a lot of work done in this area, but it uh, takes time to flow through. Uh, there's uh, recent regulations about 30% of all boards and committees have, have to have 30% uh, has to be women on the boards and committees, and so that'll that, that'll all take time to flow through. But it's all being put into action now. I was very encouraged to see a report recently where at our university, the University of South Pacific, there are, were more uh, women than men enrolling in science and technology, which I think you know augurs That's well right. for. Uh, more uh, gender empowerment in, in, in that area. Uh, as far as uh, MDG4 is concerned, the reduction of child mortality, uh, we've done well in that. We're on target, uh, which is uh, the same with uh, MDG5, the reduction of uh, maternal mortality. We're on target for both of those two. Um, MDG6 on HIV, unfortunately, there we can't say that we're on target because there has been an increase in the tr HIV trends in Fiji. But we are really addressing this very positively. Our, our head of state is the uh, South Pacific representative for UN AIDS, and he's very forthright in his campaign to uh, address the scourge of HIV AIDS. And in fact, he'll be attending the conference here in June, um, which uh, is being held at the UN. On MDG 7, ensuring environmental uh, sustainability, Again, we get a pass mark on that, um, and uh, it's um, obviously, you know, a, a big part of it. It relates to our concern on climate change. Uh, so we've uh, passed recent uh, regulations on Red Plus, uh, you know, the saving of forests, and um, obviously a lot of targeting on um, uh, oceans with sustainable fisheries management, that sort of thing. Uh, as far as NG8 is concerned, development of a global partnership for development, um, we again have got a fairly mixed result on this just because of the increasing um, national debt and um, the reliance on that. So overall, uh, done uh, we're reasonably well. We're, we're going to meet our targets on uh, four of the eight uh, MDGs, and uh, there's only one of them where you could say that we are not doing well. The other three, we've got um, reasonable results, but we're not on target yet. Well, from what you've shared with us, it sounds like the government is, is quite forthright about it and also very committed within its national plan. Very so that's much very so. That's very promising. Very much so. Uh, every one of our ministers uh, brings MDGs into their speeches. Uh, that's very apparent, yes. Ambassador, let's cross over to sustainable development. As a small island development, developing state, how do you sort of sustain yourself as a small nation within the caucus of uh, your neighboring uh, 11 states in, in terms of really truly sustaining it uh, in, in a business sense, right, yes. in development? Yes. Look, regionalism has always been very strong in the Pacific Islands. So we're going back uh, hundreds of years in saying that. Uh, we've shared institutions uh, and Fiji for geographical reasons and for transport reasons is something of a hub in the uh, Pacific Islands. So we host uh, like three universities in Fiji, one of which is the regional university in the South Pacific. Uh, we um, have the main uh, civil aviation hub at Nandi Airport. Uh, so we tend to, uh, we've had a regional airline called Air Pacific, which um, services out to all the, uh, the islands, as well as having the connections between Australia, New Zealand, and um, Asia, and North America. Um, other areas of cooperation have been in uh, uh, regional organizations, such as the Pacific Community, which is based in Numea, uh, the Forum Secretariat, which is based in Fiji, and the Melanesian Spearhead Group, which is based in Vanuatu. So in all these groups, we, we work very closely together as countries. Here in, at the United Nations, we have an organization called PSIDS, which is the Pacific Small Island Developing States. We meet at a heads of mission level, the, the 11 Pacific Island countries that are based here in New York, we meet at a heads of mission level uh, once a month. In fact, we're going away for a retreat this weekend coming up, uh, where we discuss um, uh, issues of common concern to us, current event, current um, resolutions, draft resolutions at the UN, that sort of thing, um, and w strategies for things like climate change and what we should be doing about it and so on. So we caucus once a month. Uh, we also have a um, 
working committee which meets at the next level down in our missions and is very active. So in this way, um, with our small resources as small island countries, we can actually group together and be something of a force. I mean, 11 votes at the United Nations out of 192 members is quite a few votes. But powerful just as much, right? <laughs> There's, uh, there's strength in, in numbers and unity, at least. I, um, I'd like to maybe get a bit more concrete. You mentioned something quite insightfully uh, about blue economy. Now, the UN, of course, on a daily basis, just about talks about green economy in terms of sustainable, sustainable development. Where is the tie-in? And extrapolate a bit more on blue economy. Well, uh, the blue economy is something that the Pacific Island ambassadors will always mention whenever anybody mentions green economy. And I think uh, that, that probably holds true for the IOSIS ambassadors as well uh, from the Caribbean and the Indian Ocean. Basically, our, the, the, our perspective as island countries is that when people talk about green economy, you know, they're talking about uh, renewable energy and um, uh, moving into sustainable measures like that. Uh, but from our point of view, it's no good the land-based countries <laughs> getting their, um, their act together in terms of a sustainable future for humanity if the oceans are allowed to die in the meantime. And when I say die, when we look at things like ocean acidification, uh, the dumping of, of waste by industrialized nations, um, the, um, the death of coral, the way that uh, the, the, the fish resources of the world are being exploited at a completely unsustainable rate. Uh, addressing those problems is what we call the blue economy. Uh, and I guess, you know, you could say it's about saving the oceans because we don't believe that life on land can be sustained if uh, the, the blue side of our planet, which is the majority of our planet, is allowed to atrophy in the way that it is doing at the moment. So this is why, especially with the build-up to Rio Plus 20, we're really mm -hmm. emphasizing this whole concept of blue economy. So Ambassador, enlighten me, how come we don't hear much about blue economy when it sounds just as important as deforestation and forest degradation and you know other green, green economy ter uh, terms and issues? W is it the same thing as a political will or is it just not, not having enough uh, sort of a f a front-face uh, front topic yet? I think uh, you'll find it emerging uh, as, a, as a strong new concept uh, in the approach to Rio Plus 20. Uh, I was in a G77 uh, meeting the other day where the President of the General Assembly came to address G77 and during question and answer time I raised this whole matter because he talked about the green economy and I raised uh, with him the, the matter of the blue economy. And he said to myself and to the G77 ambassador's president, well, this is the first time I've really thought about that concept, uh, the blue economy. And he said, going forward, I'm certainly going to be mentioning it myself. So I think um, by that little example, you can see that it's, it's, it's a fairly new concept, but one which is gaining ground. Switching over to the Asian group. Fiji has just successfully chaired uh, the Asian group in, in leading consultations and discussions, for example, on the next uh, president of the 66th you know, General Assembly and such things. And you've spoken to me about wanting to see more uh, representation, if you will, at the UN for the Asian group. Can you extrapolate on that? Yeah. Um, last year, um, we put forward, uh, when I say we, I mean the, the Pacific SIDS, the Peace SIDS, the 11 Pacific Island missions. It was an initiative that came from us, uh, but has been adopted by the Asian group as something that is now on the table. Uh, in fact, there were two initiatives. Um, the first was that we should consider some way of getting fair representation for the smaller countries in the Asian group. Now, bear in mind the Asian group is 54 countries, and that at least 50% of them are smaller countries. In an Asian context, when you think of the fact that we have China, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, uh, just to name a few, uh, in, in our group, you know, the, the, we, we've over 60% of the world's population in our group. And, but of, of the, that group of 54 countries, as I say, uh, half of them are small countries. So we would like a place at the table, not all the time, but uh, occasionally. And Security Council elections are, are a good example of that. Uh, so that has been accepted by the Asian group as something that should be discussed and developed going forward for our group. 
The other thing that we put forward was the idea of nomenclature change for the Asian group. And the rationale behind that is that when the Asian group was formed, uh, there were no Pacific Island countries in it. Uh, but from 1970 onwards, which is when Fiji became a member of the uh, United Nations and going forward from there to the early 2000s, uh, we, we've now got 12 countries which are from the Pacific Islands who are members of the United Nations. Of those 12, 11 are members of the Asian group. The 12th, Kiribati, doesn't have a mission in New York, so they're not yet members of the Asian group. But uh, uh, with 11 of us in the Asian group, that means that over 20%, I think it's something like 22%, uh, are um, Pacific Island countries. And yet we're not part of Asia, we're part of Oceania. So we've put a proposition that the Asian group name should be changed to the Asia Pacific group, and we are hopeful that, that will happen sometime this year. Very well. We cannot have a conversation with a permanent representative of Fiji without talking about and acknowledging peacekeeping troops really uh, all over the world. I think it was since 1970, if not prior to that, right? Um, how is that looking today, and what is the progress for the future there? Um, we've had uh, a peacekeeping role now, as you say, since the 1970s. Um, uh, that was with the battalion that went to... Um, Lebanon, UNIFIL, where we had a battalion there for many, many years. Uh, we also went into the multinational force in the Sinai uh, not long after that, uh, President Jimmy Carter's days, if I remember right. Uh, Fiji was the first to answer that call. Uh, we've had a battalion stationed in the Sinai on the border between Israel and Egypt uh, ever since to this day. Um, we have been in uh, a multitude of UN uh, peacekeeping uh, missions around the world. Uh, currently, we are in uh, Darfur with about uh, 30 people there, I think it is. Uh, we, uh, we're in um, Southern Sudan, and we have about another 30 in Liberia. Uh, we've been in, uh, we still have somebody in Timor. Um, we provide the UN Guard in Iraq with over 200 soldiers. Fijian soldiers there uh, since 2004 and uh, that number is currently being reviewed with the withdrawal of US forces from Iraq. There's a UNAMI review on at the moment. Mm -hmm. So yes, Fiji has a very uh, proud role in peacekeeping uh, and it's at the center of our foreign policy and ha has been since the 1970s. So we're very proud of it. It's amazing, as you should be. Ambassador, my final question is on a more personal note to you. As an advocate for Fiji, what would you say is your most challenging, um, you know, what are you faced with at the UN uh, when, you want, when it comes to seeing change for your country? Um, I, I arrived here February last year, January last year, I think it was. Um, uh, and at that time, I found that um, Fiji's uh, reform agenda and its path back to parliamentary democracy, because we don't have a parliament at present, was very misunderstood here in New York. So my role was to explain what we were doing in Fiji in terms of the reform agenda, and to give certainty to the fact that what we have set down as our roadmap for returning to parliamentary democracy with general elections in 2014 is set in concrete. Uh, I think the, the, the second point I needed to make because it wasn't well enough understood, was that all these reforms are for the good, that for the first time in our national history, and bear in mind we became independent in 1970 and have had several constitutions since then, several coup d'etats, um, that for the first time in our history, in 2014, we will go to general elections uh, on a one-man, one-vote basis without regard to race. Now that sounds extraordinary, but every constitution we have had since we stopped being a British Crown colony and became an independent nation has involved elections based on racial roles. The Indian population, the indigenous population, and what are called the general electorate, which are all the others. Uh, so we uh, are undergoing a reform process at the moment, which, as well as many other reforms, is getting rid of that racial segregation at electoral levels. And as I say, in 2014, we'll be proceeding to elections for the first time in our history without regard to race. 
Ambassador, you represent a beautiful country. Thank you. With its geography and, of course, its people. And I can't wait to go and visit. You must. Thank you so much for joining <laughs> okay. us here on South South News. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for joining us here on South South News. I'm Afaf Kanja. We'll see you soon.